Um, I'm William Huber. I head the Center for Excellence in Game Education at Abertay University in Dundee, Scotland. Uh, Abertay University is the home of Europe's oldest computer games program, and it's ranked as one of the best places in Europe to study game design by the Princeton Review. Yeah, that's right. Um, a lot of my job is thinking about game education and, and its future. Uh, we started giving degrees out in 1997, and that's coming up to about 20 years of uh, teaching people how to make games, a couple decades of worth of alumni out uh, in the industry and in the arts, making commercial games, making independent games, and doing all sorts of other things. Uh, more of that in a bit. So um, I'm from California, from the Bay Area. And after I finished my undergraduate studies, I worked in the software industry for a while, uh, f mostly for a company which makes software for, for game and media creation. But I felt the call of the ivory tower. At heart, I'm an academic. In fact, they, they paid me not to touch the code. Um, and I became particularly interested in what it meant to make software that makes culture, especially digital games. At the time, there weren't really a lot of people who were thinking hard about digital games as a cultural form. So I became a writer and a researcher in an emerging field that's called game studies. I was a co-editor of one of the first academic game blogs. I did my graduate studies all in California on games and software. I'm particularly interested in game aesthetics and how they change over time. I approach games, digital and otherwise, the way that an art historian like Johann Winkelmann might have approached painting and sculpture, or the way that a literary theorist like uh, Julia Kristeva might have approached the novel or poetry, et cetera. Um, her ideas about horror, for example, might give people creating horror games like Dear Esther and Amnesia uh, something to think about. But I'm not really here to talk about my research as such. This chart pretty much sums up what I do. Um, instead, I'm going to talk about the possible directions for game education and what it means for emerging modes of engagement with culture. Game studies does make an appearance, and I think this talk will almost by accident answer the question, uh, should we be studying games academically? That's really kind of a side effect. Um, instead, I'm going to talk about Scotland and how I got here. Specifically, uh, I'm going to talk a bit about Dundee, which is Scotland's fourth largest city. Scotland technically has four cities. Um, before I came to Scotland, I used to teach and do my research and build curriculum at USC in the School of Cinematic Arts in Los Angeles. Uh, during my time there, uh, USC's program became world-leading. Um, and it had a few advantages. It was located in a film school, which allowed them a lot of flexibility with the curriculum. They can change how and what they teach from year to year without a lot of uh, administrative overhead. It has the support of the university administration, which was completely uh, committed to building it. It was located in a university that has a strong art school and a strong engineering school attached to it with many good writing courses. It had supports from visionary in the game industry. Um, and importantly, of course, it's in Los Angeles. Uh, while USC was a fantastic place to be, I moved for a couple reasons. For one thing, my family started to feel that the sunshine was becoming oppressive. And our son decided that he wanted to learn how to play the bagpipes. That's not my son. And ultimately, you felt the draw of Europe, which is home to some of the most exciting and successful games of the past five years. And compared to some other media forms, Europe has, is in a position to have a world leading, um, take a world leading place in, in game development. It has its challenges, but it has incredible promise. So we moved to tropical Scotland. I live here in Edinburgh, but I work here at Abertay University in Dundee. It's a modern university, but it has the oldest games program in Europe. It's been de designated as the natural, National Center for Excellence in Game Education. Uh, in institutions without a focus on making games, the study of games is treated as a domain. 
So you could be a sociologist, you can be an anthropologist, and you can do your work in games as a field, but you'll be expected to work on the problems that are interesting to other sociologists and anthropologists. When you work at an institution that's focused on games, you can focus on the, the questions that are specific to that, to that cultural form, to that art form. And that's the liberating quality of uh, essentially doing game studies and being a humanist at a school that's focused on game making. Now the Scottish government, like many other European national and regional governments, recognizes the game industry as strategically important and is especially important for the city of Dundee. Public support for the cultural center, sector is something that is stronger in Europe and the UK than it is in the States. There's advantages and disadvantages to it versus a system of corporate patronage which dominates in the US. And US publishers and studios are generally more accustomed to providing direct material support to education. But Scotland has some particular strengths in the game sector, especially the city of Dundee. I'll tell you a little bit about the city of Dundee. It's very different from Los Angeles, I'm sure many of you have discovered that. And it's even different from Edinburgh. It's a, it was a medieval port city. It thrived economically in the 18th and 19th century based on the pillars of what's been called the three J's of Dundee's economy. The first J is jute, fabric used for sailing ships and clothing. There was, there's a museum of the history of jute about, um, in the center of the town, as we're seeing. Many of the grand houses in the area were built for and owned by jute barons, um, and some of the wealthiest people in 19th century Britain emerged from the jute industry. The second J is jam, marmalade in particular, and even more particularly, Keeler's marmalade, named after its creator, Janet Keeler, uh, who, an entrepreneur, uh, believed to have created the first commercial brand of marmalade in Dundee and opened their shop in 1797. And the fourth J is journalism, uh, the publishing firm now known as DC Thompson. All these industries employed a lot of Dundonians well into the early 20th century. But slowly, international competition, slow reinvestment, and changes in technology meant that these industries began to shrink or move out of the city. Dundee, like many of the cities of the uh, British North, suffered greatly under the period of deindustrialization after 1983. While in other parts of Europe, there were focused programs of innovation, retraining, upskilling, and other types of public investment which made the transitions to post-industrial economies easier. Within the UK, the transition was rougher and arguably still hasn't been completed. From 1979 to 1999, the conservative government began dismantling the apparatus which could affect this transition in the post-war economy and choose instead to focus on free market ideas which didn't fit well with a labor base lacking the skills and education appropriate for emerging markets. The UK that emerged from this period is a fairly unequal one. London is one of the richest areas in Northern Europe, while nine of the 10 poorest regions of Northern Europe are located in the UK. Dundee was hard hit by this turn of history with some of the highest unemployment rates in Europe some of the lowest life expectancies, um, and other indicators of a dysfunctional social system. But it did have a few bright spots. One was a Timex factory opened in 1945. It started off making watches for the US firm, but by the 1980s, they were making the ZX Spectrum. It was one of the most affordable home computers of the time, and it led to an explosion of local game design and development. There's a few reasons for this. Computer programming courses at the Dundee Institute of Technology, which later became Abertay University, and the widespread availability of ZX Spectrum systems created a culture of design and development. For the employees of the Timex factor, factory, however, the realities of globalization, descaling, and deindustrialization hit Dundee. Timex stopped making the ZX Sinclair after 1986, moving production to places where the cost of labor was lower. And in, 1999, in 1992, 
After losing money for several years, the Timex factory became the site of the last major strike in the series of strikes that marked that era. Uh, the de while the deindustrialization of the, of the UK was inevitable, it could be argued that it was poorly managed compared to the way that process uh, was managed in areas like northern Germany and Scandinavia. Timex went from employing 5,000 people in the days of the next spectrum, when it was the largest employer in Dundee, to employing 70 people at low wages before being closed at the end of the strike. So I'd, li I'd like to turn this into a really happy story about how an emerging industry, the game industry, saved the city of Dundee. But the, the, the truth of it, and as an academic, we, deal with, we, we try to deal with things truthfully, is that for many of the people who are working at the Timex factory, women, most of them, including the leaders of the industrial action, they were skilled assembly workers, but they weren't software developers. They didn't get to enjoy the benefits of the emerging game industry, and many fell into poverty. There's no way they could have competed on a wage level with East Asia due to the higher costs of housing and food in the UK. These economic stories that are happy at a regional level are not always happy at the level of actual lives of the people who live there. The plant closed in 1993. Dundee had won the contract uh, to build the Timex, uh, um, build the Timex factory um, due to its low cost labor and it lost the factory due to even lower cost labor. But there was one person who had been employed there during the 1980s, David Jones, who as a very young man worked in the ZX Sinclair unit before Timex moved its production overseas. He is said to have uh, spent his redundancy package on a Commodore Amiga. He had, he had been working on a computer science degree at Abertay University while experimenting with game programs with his friends in a computer club. He created a studio, DMA Design, now called Rockstar North, the, creation, the creator of the most financially successful commercial product in history, GTA V, but only long after it moved to Edinburgh and was acquired by New York-based Take-Two Interactive. I still think there's something very Scottish about the GTA series as a kind of poisoned love letter to America. That's a talk for another day. When it started, it was a group of friends who met at the Kingsway Amateur Computer Club in Dundee. They developed on the Commodore 64 and on the Amiga 1000, as well as the Sinclair Spectrum. The first game they created was a side-scrolling shooter called Menace. And uh, he wrote it while he was living in his parents' home, which continues to be a model for uh, indie game development. It sold about 15,000 copies in the year after its release, which was fantastic for an indie game at the time, and it allowed him to fund a studio. He hired programmers and developers who were also studying at Aberté. And uh, this, the, the term didn't quite exist then, but this was a scale of production we call uh, an indie team today. The fourth game developed by DMA became a global success, Lemmings, released in 1991. The economic success of this game was enough to make economic waves in the city of Dundee, and the perception that Dundee could pursue some kind of leadership in the industry followed on from it. Most of the people who would work in the studios producing games in the 90s came from Abertay University, and by 1997, we began offering Europe's first bachelor degree in computer game technology. Um, and a master's degree as well. It was conceived as a the master's degree was conceived as a conversion course to allow people with a general computer science background to specialize in games, and it reflected the perception of the needs of the industry at the time. The growing industry uh, understood that it needed individuals with focused technical competencies who would join up with a burgeoning local industry. Grand Theft Auto was released in 97, and soon after this, DMA, which would be bought by a number of companies before uh, being taken over by Take-Two Games, uh, moved to Edinburgh. Reasons for the move and the closure are informative. A lot of it has to do with what it takes to attract and hold on to a creative class. Other studios opened and would hire teams of people laid off by the closing of earlier ones. There was Real Time Worlds, which opened 
in 2002 and closed in 2010. Yo-Yo Games, a uh, producer of the engine GameMaker Pro, uh, set, up a, set up studio in, set up a uh, presence in Dundee. Rage Studios, Ruffian Games, they, prov uh, they all relied on a skilled workforce of programmers, artists, and designers coming from Abertay University. Now, Dundee's, Dundee's situation um, was pr pretty unique in terms of the history of the game industry. A town with a struggling economy, far from the usual centers of either cultural or, or technological economic activity, was punching far above its weight in this industry. Abertay's role was more than just educating creators. It had to act as a center of gravity for a fragile industry, helping incubate and accelerate new studios. It now hosts uh, residential game competitions, Dare to be Digital, which culminate in the award of a BAFTA, and it runs, uh, uh, which are, and the finalists from Dare to be Digital are showcased at Dare Pro to Play, one of the largest independent game festivals in Europe with free public admission. The game sector in Dundee is embraced by the city council and the community at large. And um, as a contrast, so I came from Los Angeles, and Los Angeles is an industry town. If you ask somebody, uh, if you ask somebody what the industry means, it's just cinema. It's film. Um, if you say you work in games in Los Angeles in a cinema, in an industry crowd, they kind of look at you like, no, oh, that's nice. I'm going to talk to that person over there in the industry. If you tell someone you're in games in Dundee, um, they'll shake your hand, thank you, and, and, and um, make you feel like you're really welcome. And so people who come from um, around the world do the, the festivals. When they come to Proto Play, they're often taken aback by the way that uh, the community has embraced their industry. So the initial focus of Aberté uh, in the early aughts was to place its students into AAA studios and the service bureaus which work with them. Um, it's important that students in Aberté come from all walks of life. Scotland remains committed to a pretty close to free education, and this focus initially was on learning specific technologies and skills and pipelines, on learning how to crunch on creating and acting upon game design documents, on fulfilling a brief or a work specification, and on the de development of technical craft. Now, we all know what's happened to the AAA industry. It's still around, it's still here, it still hires people, it still makes money, but it's not the gold industry, the gold rush industry it was 10 to 15 years ago. And it's not the heart and soul of gaming. Many of the studios that were at the heart of Dundee's initial game boom have closed or moved. To put it in context, the average game career lasts about five years, and, uh, according to research commissioned by the International Game Developers Association. Uh, pardon the Bowie reference. I made this slide slightly before he passed away, but uh, it still works. According to their research, most people who leave the game industry go into various uh, IT and digital media sectors. Uh, the software industry absorbs a lot of them, who at the best of, and those who get taken up into these industries at the best of times still stick around uh, to participate in game making or mentoring when they can. Some go into media production, and they do all right. I have absolutely no reservations about recommending a game education to anyone. Um, people who leave the game industry move on to very strong careers. Uh, the loss is not to those people, per se. It's to the rest of us who are still in that industry and the rest of us who um, play and consume games. Um, the game industry serves, these, uh, serves the people who go through it well as an apprenticeship, and they end up getting paid better in more stable, if somewhat less fun, industries if and when they move on. And the loss is to us and the audiences, who lose the opportunity to see the wisdom, maturity, and perspective of the creators as they get older. I remember reading somewhere that the average debut novelist's age is 37. That's when they, they often publish the, the average age to publish your first novel. And that's past the game industry's retirement age. But there's another loser. Regional economies lose, and local communities lose, as the creative energy and excitement 
that orbits game scenes and game cultures dissipates and moves away. These industries that absorb game talent, I think of as buffers. Veterans of development can jump back, and f uh, back in after a while. They can offer mentorship and even investment. But if those industries which catch people leaving the industry aren't nearby, if they move to London or they emigrate to Los Angeles or San Francisco or New York, um, that doesn't help uh, cities like Dundee. Many of the people leaving the game, game industry move out of Dundee or out of Scotland. Both the Scottish government and the Dundee City Council want to support a healthy game industry in the area. But they're still committed to a model where medium to large in studio employs a few hundred people in a wide range of uh, roles. They reasonably want to make sure that the public investment they're putting into studios pays off. The problem is metrics. How do you gauge success? How do you make sure the public investment going in to support an industry is going to the right places? A big studio opening and hiring a few hundred people for a few years is an easy success to understand. Trying to attract large existing firms to locate offices in the area is the, the, the default approach to regional development. But in an environment where dozens, perhaps over 100, very small studios, from two to 10 people, starting and closing continuously, popping up, is not a model that they understand how to support beyond an initial stage. They don't even know how to gauge whether their investment in that model is paying off. They can't just count seats filled, and it's not easy to figure out the ripple out of effects and benefits of a churning economy of very small studios. They're smart people. They do understand that things have changed. The question is how to best support it. You know, the game industry has changed a lot over the past 10 to 20 years. Games have become incredibly expensive to make, and they become incredibly cheap and easy to make. What this means for game education is this. A skill-centered approach directed for a specialized role in a very big production system works for large-scale games development, but it's inadequate for the many small studios approach. When you combine focus on upskilling with the small studios model, you get the outsourcing model. There's a place for it, especially if there's something you do really, really well, like motion capture or AI or localization then a very skills-focused approach can be beneficial. But as a strategy for regional development, it leaves a lot to be desired. The problem with a skill-centered approach is that specialization leaves you vulnerable to changes in technology and price competition. It's easy to say that not everyone in the game sector is going to be producing original content or will have a clear authorial voice or identity. Attention to craft is valuable. Successful projects need people who are focused and dedicated to the craft of their roles. The problem occurs that these craft roles are often more fungible than the roles which have more authorship, than those roles which are associated with named people in recognized teams in known places. When the 90s game boom was happening, game development was still fairly local. Today, it's possible to produce a game using production houses and bureaus that are distributed throughout the world. And for the perspective of economic development, of making sure that the people in your region of interest have jobs and are producing goods and service for, for others in a way that lets them maintain a decent standard of living, you don't want your industry nor your career to be too fungible. So this is a challenge for game education, especially if you're not in Los Angeles or London or Tokyo. How do you make your local game economy one that can't easily be switched out for another, a cheaper one that does the same work as yours? Second problem, how do we challenge the insularity of gaming? Not the idea that games are only entertainment goods. We dispatched that one a long time ago with serious games and art games and all the rest. But the isolation of game making and all its skills and competencies from other fields of design and culture and media. On a plane from Edinburgh to London, I saw this article uh, in the InFlight magazine. It discussed something called the flat white economy, named after the, uh, the, the third wave coffee drink. Third wave economy is a mixture of design and creative services and IT and, well, pretty much anything. 
It's outperforming the financial sector as an economic force right now. It's currently adding 34 billion pounds a year to the UK economy. It's where job growth is, and it's having a cultural impact uh, on London. Uh, and at an event a couple of years ago in Edinburgh, Brian Bagelow, the head of the Scottish Games Network, noted something interesting, that those of us in games, those of us who produce, design, develop games, we're not participating in this sector. Even when times are slow and when jobs are scarce, there's a gulf between games and this vital digital sector. Uh, the problem is more pronounced in the UK than it is in the US. The people who are starting the studios that work in this sector and partic participating in this amazing economic force are coming from traditional liberal arts programs in, in the ancient universities and in art schools like Goldsmiths and St. Martins. They're also coming from schools with strong humanities programs. They're going to people with competence in understanding culture and how people engage with it. Game education in the UK still takes place within modern universities that are generally former polytechnics, most of which have no real humanities programs at all. Meanwhile, the top games programs in the US, USC, NYU, the University of California, Santa Cruz, and Irvine, are in schools which also embrace the arts and humanities. They create compelling original IP, and they usually don't call it IP. They leave those terms for the lawyers. Meanwhile, there is, to be blunt, a class divide between the schools which produce cultural innovation in the UK and those which produce skilled workers. These schools that produce uh, culturally sophisticated workers are attended by young people from wealthier, comfortable backgrounds. The takeover of cultured life by those from privileged backgrounds has been the topic of recent discussion here in the UK. This isn't the case for games programs in the UK. And one of the things I'm very proud about in the Aberté is our ability to bring in people from a very diverse range of backgrounds. But one of the side effects of the types of universities that are hosting game education programs is they stick to a very vocational rhetoric about game education. It's not about who you become, it's about the seat you might be able to fill, the job you can get. It's a rhetoric which isn't serving us well. And that leads me to part two of my talk, the emergence of Generation Minecraft. And this is why the current situation is a problem. So this is the generation I grew up in. I call it Generation Atari. Um, I, I played games like Pitfall or Indiana Jones. Um, and the, what I'm getting at here is not the platform. I'm not talking about the te technology. I'm not really talking about the, the game industry specific business model. I'm talking about the mode of cultural engagement. How we understood content, how content moved through a value chain, um, where we thought authority lied. When I played a game of Indiana Jones, I understood this as a derivative interpretation of a content that occurred elsewhere. There was a, a chain of authority that led all the way back to Steven Spielberg. The authoritative form of that game was Indiana Jones. Pitfall and these other brilliant, fantastic games, I loved them, but I understood that authority really laid elsewhere. The, the value chain led up to um, an IP owner that was very remote from me. And everything I consume simply pointed towards the distant truth of the franchise with which I was engaged. These are the, some of the features of what I would describe as Generation Atari. The people who grew up in Generation Atari created uh, the, a new environment that young people grew up in. I call that Generation Pokemon. It's a very different approach to IP. Um, and I, this is what characterized the, the young cultural consumption of what I would call the millennials, what we call, now call the millennials. With networked audiences, creating their own system of interpretation. One of the features of Pokemon is that you don't know what the canonical form of Pokemon was when you were a child. Was it, was, did the animated series come out first? Was it the game? Was it the card game? It didn't really matter. 
rather than cascading from an original authority. It was more like a database of content with which we could interact with multiple channels. Instead of there being distant authority, there was a culture of expertise, and we could become experts on Pokemon when we went to school, and we would read Nintendo Power Magazine and learn all the things about the content we were doing. Eventually, we start feeling re feel comfortable reappropriating and reinterpreting that content. Altruism at this point was still managed. Intellectual property was still managed. The Pokemon company to this day still continues to manage and control its IP. Um, so at one time, we thought this was the future of cultural engagement. We thought this was the end of the story, the end of history. We were wrong. This is a kid, the generation my kid is growing up in. What does my kid like to watch on television? He does watch uh, some nature documentary, and documentaries, and he's still a big fan of David Attenborough. But for the most part, what he really likes to watch is people slightly older than himself playing games. He learned about Pokemon by watching um, a YouTuber play a modified version of Minecraft, which re-implemented the dynamics of the original Pokemon game at it. And he listened to the banter of the YouTuber and his friend going through the game, failing and, and laughing accordingly. So this is what children who aren't even teenagers yet are doing. And he also immediately sussed that he could do the same. He immediately started thinking, he realized we have a camera, I got a camera in my pocket. I'll put something on YouTube. He has, on a, you know, um, part of my parental responsibility is to keep it somewhat private, but he has his own little YouTube channel. And they immediately speak back to the people who are producing the culture with which they engage. I no longer use the word consume here. I think if you think of the, this generation as cultural consumers rather than, than a generation that's going to engage with culture as a peer, we're going to miss what's really happening here. Almost as a side effect of this culture, they get a grip on media production. Now, what does this mean for game education? What an art school does historically has been very different than what a game school does. To put it briefly, game education can and should become a little more like art and film education, and indeed largely subsume them, not just focused on skilling up, or, this is critically important, not even just on experimentation and innovation, but also cultivating sophistication in the nuances of style, the historical and cultural forces which drive audience tastes, the cultivation of a voice, and the training of an intuition about the implications of aesthetic choices and how audiences engage with what you do. I think this is going to be the challenge for us as educators in the future. We have to think about the entire in, uh, engagement experience as part of the design, wrapping business models and engagement models into design at the very first stage. It's how we get from producing content to producing platforms. Because what my son engaged with most is not content, it's with platforms. Minecraft is a platform, Roblox is a platform, YouTube is a platform. We have to learn to run, and learn how to fund and run a small studio as a business or a bureau, to make a business plan and apply it. Uh, and those of you who are starting an indie studio, if you look among, your, among yourselves and don't know who the business guy is, don't know who the business woman is, hire her, hire him, bring him into your team. Somebody who knows how to, knows how to grow, knows how to talk to people who will support your studio. Uh, the ability not just to find investors and publishers or run a crowdfunding campaign, that's all great, but also to seek commissions from arts foundations, public agencies, and even research funding bodies. This is something that can be taught at a university because there's a lot of people in research and art with a lot of experience in doing just that. At Aberté, like a lot of other game programs, we rely on mentorship. But mentorship has in the past usually been about the product and not about the running of a studio, of a business. Already this is changing as mentors that are coming in 
are those that are running some very small studios successfully. But we need to continue on this. We definitely don't need to expect everyone in a game program to show the kind of sophistication and aesthetics and style that an art school does. But again, this is a matter of including that competency in your team. There should be some recruitment into game schools on this basis and some reflection of that in the curriculum. Perhaps the challenge in game education and in building a team of, of game makers is to recruit people who aren't particularly enthusiastic about making games as such, but have something to say or way of thinking about engagement that's best expressed through a game. Excitement and enthusiasm and passion are very exciting and lovely words, but they may be having a filtering effect. We may want to more calmly and quietly say, you have something very important to say, and we think that a game might be the best way for you to say it. There are cultures of critique at the best art schools, but the purpose of that isn't just producing criticism. We do that in the postgrad level. Um, it's a complication of thought around what you do, about changing and cultivating creative instincts. Game schools are and should be different from art schools. They're teaching a very different design and production methodology. Maybe they're closer to film schools, and it may explain a lot of USC success that they came out of a film program. But I also think they're actually the early stages of something very different, a model for creative education built around a relationship between personal voice and vision and collaborative practice, even community-oriented practice. What I'm talking about here is a direction of travel, not a, not, um, a destination. Anyway, that's all I have for today. Thanks for giving me, me your attention. I hope you enjoy the rest of the event, and I'm looking forward to our little panel. My name's Gareth Kavanagh. I'm incredibly Welsh, so <laughs> if you don't understand what I'm saying, the danger words are, Gareth, stop! Rewind, right? Okay, can you understand what I'm saying? Excellent. Um, uh, just to explain my background, uh, I've been a professional animator for the last 17 years. Uh, I've worked in games, uh, I've worked in kids' TV, Fine Man Sam. Uh, I've worked uh, as an academic, I've worked in academia as well. I, I taught for eight years on the computer animation and game art course in South Wales, in Cardiff. Uh, it used to be called University of Glamorgan, now it's University of South Wales. Uh, I've also taught, uh, well, I ran the, the game enterprise course at the USW as well. And that was, it was an interesting course actually because it was a game design course but with an entrepreneurial spin as well. So I, 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 everything William just spoke about resonates really strongly because the, the focus on that course wasn't just teaching the kids, the students, how to make games, but it was teaching them how to market those games, how to sell those games. So what, what you said there about you know, identify the, the business person, that were, that's incredibly important now in the current climate because these guys weren't, they weren't making AAA games. They had no intention of making AAA games. They were making independent games for themselves by themselves, you know, so they had to know how to sell these things. Um, I also, at the moment, I, I've just finished one job. I was uh, the animation manager for a games dev studio in South Wales called Oyster World Games. Uh, and I also run my own micro business called Iron Town Interactive. Uh, because I, 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 I really want to make games that educate rather than just games that you, that you sit and immerse yourself in. I want to make educational games. So for the last few years, I've been making a, a, a game called Iron. I'm from the South Wales Valleys. I'm from Merthyr Tydfil. I don't know if you know of Merthyr Tydfil, but it does share uh, an industrialization background very similar to Dundee. You know, we had uh, an iron production uh, heritage that was decimated and coal uh, during the 70s and so the, the town is only just, well, it's, it's not recovering, but it's, move, it's starting to buds of recovery, you know. Um, and I wanted to make a game about that industrial heritage. My, my, the first idea of it was I wanted to make 
uh, Red Dead Redemption in Merthyr, but I didn't think that would work from an educational point of view because I didn't want to talk about prostitutes and stuff like that in schools. So we lost that bit and made it more educational. But um, so yeah, that's, that's my, in a nutshell, that's my background. I got lots of, lots of game hats, lots of animation hats. Uh, yeah, hello. Uh, but yeah, so I, I'm just here to talk uh, and to pick up on a lot of the points that William made about um, uh, uh, the, the, the difference now, the difference now in education. Uh, when, I, when, I was, uh, when I studied animation at college, it was very much, it's skill and drill, isn't it? It's lecturer stands at the front and talks and you answer questions, or you ask questions and you think, you know. But um, uh, there's, there's a difference now, it's very different. For, a part, for attention spans are incredibly different. Yeah, uh, and I blame Sky Plus for that. <laughs> the ability to fast forward, stop, skip, oh, that's, that's ruined education. Um, so we've got to we've got to think of new ways to engage people in ed, you know, engage students in education, so we don't lose them. But I don't know how you want to handle this, William. Do you want to you want to answer, let them ask questions or? Sure. I think um, we'd like to hear from you. Many of you out here are, are studying games, making games. Hmm. There's a lot of people who are in game education right now, um, and you probably you have more perspective on where, where it's taking you than we do. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, just as a, as a show of hands then, yeah, um, just for me to gauge the sort of, you know, who you are as students. Uh, are there co coders, you know, devs? Yeah, one or two. Um, designers, we've had quite a few designers. Artists, um, you know, animators, 3D modelers. Okay, so it's, fair, it's fairly diverse then, yeah? Are you happy with the way that you are being taught? Don't be afraid. Are, they, are these you students? Right, right. No. Well, so, yeah. we have, we have um, people from all around the world. Right. Come, come um, so I guess the question, one question I have is about aspiration, mm. right? So originally when game education began, there was one outlet, right? Mm -hmm. That was the, the, the seat in the chair, you know, the, put the bum mm. in the seat, right? Yep. Um, and, uh, you know, the studios started small and were growing big. They're just growing at an exponential rate. And a lot of it was about keeping up with this kind of demand, this, this very hungry demand for people with very, uh, very distinctive skills. Now, the skills were changing because the tools were changing. A lot of the, the tools were in-house. Um, but nonetheless, that was the focus. It started off, those were on computer science, the first generation of games. Everyone had to be a little bit of a computer science to make one. Um, Eventually, as the tools and technologies evolved, uh, people who focused on arts, who didn't necessarily know how to code or didn't have, uh, people who had very specialized functionalities that weren't, didn't overlap as much, it became viable and game education caught up and said, okay, we're gonna have an arts program and we're gonna have a design program and we're going to have a kind of programming program. Um, and that's kind of still the, the, the model, but, um, Eventually, um, what happened was the, the bum and seats model started to join up with this indie, with a lot of students were coming with aspirations to, to produce their own games and produce their own small studios. Uh, we saw that as the growth sector had a lot to do with the emergence of mobile, but even before that, I think in the, uh, in the early aughts, there, was, uh, there started to be a, stable, a stability was introduced in the number of people who, who I mean, in the the need in the labor market in the AAA sector, um, and the growth to take place in India. So that was the second output. Um, the th I think there might be a third one coming up. So the third is for the high, might be for the hybrid studio or the hybrid career. So in the first output, you're looking for a job. In the second output, you're looking for a publisher. In the third output, which I think we, we're moving to, you're looking for an investor. You're going to be looking for people who are going to see, not just help you finish your game, but are going to help you become stable enough to produce things that might be games, they might be uh, other types of engagement and experience, it might be the next Pokemon Go, it might be the next Foursquare, um, it might be all sorts of different products. 
in which you could bring the competencies that you've developed while studying games into a range of field. So that's where I think we're going. Mm. Yeah, it's um, running a, a game studio. It's it's a it's a difficult proposition. It's not. It's first of all, it's not a sustainable economic um, model because essentially, unless you get a hell of a lot of investment up front, you don't see the benefits of your creation until the end. You know, uh, like I said, I, I'm, I've got a couple of different experiences now working in broadcast, working in games, and working in education. And the, the difference with broadcast is that it, you get commissioned up front to make it the TV show, and with that comes commissioning money and funding, and you know, in in, in sort of uh, milestone deliveries. But with games, you as an independent studio, you live or die by your sales. So if you if you spend all your, your you know your time on one intellectual property, then it's, it's almost like a lottery win. You know, you, you think, oh, well, it's going to, you know, it's an angry bird, and it might not, it might not be, it probably won't be, the first one won't be. So it's, it's, it's difficult, because once you get to that, once you finish that first one, what do you do next? Have you got the money to go on? So it's difficult. It is, it is incredibly difficult. So knowing where to go for that investment and who to approach, and that's, that's really important, and it's one thing that's not being taught in a lot of uh, a lot of games education courses. You know, so how do you you know you've got to, You've got to get up. You've got to get up and network. You've got to go. I mean, it, this, that's why things like this are important today. You know, you guys are obviously the guys who are switched on and who are passionate about what, you know this as a career because you come in to sit and listen to a bunch of people talk all day. You know, that takes a bit of you know that's that's passion. But um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the flip side of that for me um, it was something that William said earlier about uh, we, you know, you need in, I think things are diversifying even more now because the AAA and independent and stuff like that. And it's that argument of generalism versus specialism. You know, I was told in, 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 when I was in, uh, in college, specialize, if you want to be an animator, Spend all your time animating. Don't don't become an artist. Don't become a rigger. Uh, you know you need to be it. So that when you come out of college, you you'll be at a level that's hireable. You know, and you can walk straight into a job. And I, I I disagreed with that a little bit. And I thought, well, actually, no. I think I'd like to be a generalist. I'd like to be able to do a, a little bit of everything. But my primary skill will be animation. So that and and I think I think I made the best choice because. When there aren't any animation jobs around, I can go and do a little bit of modeling or a little bit of texturing. I might not be able to do it at Rockstar, where they need a specialist character artist, but I can go to an independent studio and I can do a little bit for them, you know? So, so, so it's the same with games. If you've got to decide what you want to do. Do you want to be that independent producer? Do you want to be a notch, where you do a little bit of everything and produce that game? Or do you want to be the guy or, or lady who specializes in a certain subject or certain area and therefore spend every hour, every day working towards that? And I think that's what education is, is moving towards. Hi there. Um, this is a question for both of you. Um, there's a bit of tension we have in educational sector. I'm I'm an educator, I teach game software development at Glasgow Caledonian. And the issue we have, like in the wider game sector, game education sector, is we're getting a lot of pressure to go down the skills agenda mm. from industry, from government, from our own university administrators, from our students. Mm -hmm. So how do we balance those sorts of tensions we have? Is it a matter of the long game where we have to trump these amazing indie games, these great people with great voices? Or is it a generational thing? We're just having to do this fight and the next version of our, myself will ha not have that problem. So it's just a quick throw out there to see where you see us as educators, what we can do to kind of push against that tide, so to speak. Mm. Well, it's not either or. I mean, mm. people still know how to, you have to know how to do something. Um, I think that you know, you know, there's kind of the the tactics we, we 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 need to do as educators to evidence that we have 
we have taught some, some hard skills, but wrap them in the context of something broader, right? So largely this is how, how, we, um, how we present the kind of the programs we're, we're, we're building. Um, I, whenever someone uh, kind of tries to drive a skill agenda, especially if there's, it's a panel of, of uh, politicians or, or, uh, or um, administrators, I always ask them how many of them are doing what they did, what they studied at uni right now, right? Um, and very few of them are, you know. You'll, 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 I think you'll find. Um, the other issue is uh, we need to build that case more broadly as a sector, um, especially uh, there's a hazard. I think there's a risk that uh, a lot of the pressure to, um, in my interpretation, this is going to be a little bit uh, provocative, perhaps controversial. A lot of the pressure for a skills-based agenda is about uh, lowering the cost of labor, right? Um, you, you know, that we have a lot of people who leave the game industry because, frankly, options are pretty good elsewhere. If you're a competent programmer, if you're a competent animator, you can often, you know, after five or six years in the game industry, you can leave the cycle of crunch and get paid more consistently and more in another more in adjacent industry. So, you know, some studios are like, well, you know, this 28-year-old programmer, she just left to work in the financial sector. How am I going to replace her? Well, obviously, you need to train 40 more people so I can hire four of them, right? Um, so, I mean, we need to kind of answer back and say, well, you know, you, the industry has to think about why, we, why it's running into this, this issue as well. We know um, Africare, uh, who, who is probably the most, you know, the, the kind of the most respected analyst of the games industry in the UK says that there isn't actually a shortage, as, as in, there isn't actually a shortage of educated people, trained people who know how to make games. The problem is that once they have these core skills, they don't stay in the game industry very long. 87% um, of all people in the game industry have uh, a college, uh, have a university degree that, you know, in, a, in a specialist field. Um, I think that it's about a dialogue to, to say, okay, what you're really looking for is you want to make sure that you have individuals who are gonna have a long-term relationship with your studio. And how are we gonna make that happen? How are we going to make, have continuing professional development to keep people in current skills and, 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 uh, and keep them well-trained? But I think it's, we need to think about this in terms of a sector. I don't think it's a thing that one program in isolation can, can, mm. can address. Yeah, I, I, um, we went through this uh, in the, on the Computer Animation and Games Art course because we, were, uh, we got skill set accreditation and we were pushed and pushed and pushed, specialised, specialised. And it worked for two, three years and the, it suited the industry then. It doesn't suit the industry now, you know? But I like to, I like to bring up, there's one guy, there's one guy I like to think of, right? A guy called Jamie Lee Lloyd, right? Uh, he's from from my area, from Aberdeer, and he was a Valley's commando, right? Well, he was a hell of a boy, right? And, and, he, and he was an amazing artist. And he came on the animation course, he wanted to be an animator, right? And he sucked at animation. Terrible, right? He barely got through the first year. Second year, he started playing with modeling and texturing. And the second year, he sucked at modeling and texturing. Absolutely terrible. Third year, yeah, summer of, of the third, he said, ah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my head into this now. And that summer, he picked up ZBrush and he started playing with it and he absolutely loved it, right? Third year, he specialised, right? He said, I, actually, what I want to do is I want to be a senior character artist, somewhere like Rockstar North, right? And we said, Jane, you can't do that. You, you know, you don't walk out of university and become a character artist. You've got, you know, especially at Rockstar, that's going to take some time. No, that's what I want to do. Third year, put his head down, and some of the stuff he produced was amazing, right? He graduated with the first. Uh, he went up to London, and he worked on a game called Blink. Now, uh, what's that, four, five years later, he's senior character artist at Rockstar. Absolutely amazing. Uh, he's one of the best artists, I've, 3D artists I've ever seen. But he, he specialised, and I think, really, the, the, the subject, the course, needs to allow for both. Yeah? If you want to specialise in an area, fine, we'll cater to that. If you want to be a generalist, fine, we'll cater to that. It's not easy, 
but there are, there are ways of doing it. And I think if you just go down that route of specialising, um, you, 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 the longevity of your career is going to suffer for it, you know. Yeah. Unless you position yourself across sectors, mm. that's the key. To view your specialist, your specialism as addressing a series of problems that have roots older than the older than gaming, and that those problems will exist after gaming. So when I t uh, when I speak to students about character art, I try to introduce them to the history of portraiture. People have been working on the problem of how to depict pe characters for centuries, right? If you think of yourself strictly as a character artist. Uh, working, you know, imitating other game characters. You're, address you're addressing yourself to a set of questions that's rather narrow. If you think of yourself as the latest iteration of a long tradition of understanding what it means to depict and represent people, then you have, you have footing that's going to adapt to, uh, to a changing situation. Yeah, at my, my, at my last uh, employment, uh, you know, we were looking for artists. We were never looking for, a, you know, one style. We were, look, you know, we were looking for character artists and environment artists. And it was, it was all about adaptability. They knew the skills, they knew the tools, they knew the techniques. They, one of them, had worked, the environment artist, had worked as a character artist, but he took his skill base and he, and he moved into environment art. And, and it's, it's like that, and it's the same for coding, you know, being able to work between different engines. You know, you don't define yourself as a Unity dev or an Unreal dev, you know. It's, a, it's just, a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's more of a general now, I think. And that's just my opinion. I might be totally wrong, but it's what's work and what, I, what I've experienced, you know. Anybody else got any other questions? Hello. So I was really sort of struck, William, by just, I guess you two are talking about, about this third wave, about this whole Minecraft YouTube. Um, and I guess sort of the interesting thing is like being in a games university where, you know, most of your professors are X industry, uh, that's not, they're really not familiar with that stuff, right? Generally speaking, like if, you, if you've exited the game industry and now you're teaching, um, you're sort of familiar with a very different games industry than it was, you know, like four or five years ago. I guess, um, could you maybe talk about, you know, just like from the perspective of an educator and someone working in an institution, I guess, sort of ways to sort of prepare students to also get that perspective as part of their education? Um, I'm fairly impressed with the way that my colleagues at Aberté manage to say that we, we have ongoing relationship with industry, and so that brings us in touch with new needs all the time. One thing is our, our capstone projects are driven by um, external briefs. And that means that the, the people who are running those modules, um, um, they, they're understanding what, 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 what the, the current state of, uh, of the industry is. And I think that's really vital. If you can act as a fulcrum between the local industry and the educational experience of your students, as a side effect, you're going to be continuously relearning what the needs of the, mm. what the, what the, needs of the industry are. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, I stepped out of academia because I felt that my skill base was plateauing. So I, I went back in, learned a bit more, and went back in. And that's how I think my career will go, is, is dipping in and out, you know? Because it got to a point where I felt, especially now that fees have become prevalent, you know, that my students weren't getting value for their money, you know? Stu you know that uh, I was... I was teaching old school techniques and more than a, a lot of the students were coming in they knew more than me straight away because they've been on YouTube or they've been on digital tutors and that's what academia that's what an educator has to has to put up with now it's an extra thing to fight against you know is that you've got you've always I think you've always to a point you've got to stay just a little bit ahead of the students and the only way you can do that is by dipping in and out but there is a point, and it's and absolutely right that the student will get, you know, will get to a better level than you because they're going to be sitting there doing it every day, and that's absolutely right, you know, because we are, you know, essentially we are just opening the door to you, and we get you so far, and the rest is up to you then, you know. Yeah. But uh, yeah, there's, you know, yeah, there are still students coming out from my area that are lacking in a lot of important skills. You know? 
I mean, ultimately in higher education, we do not do brain dumps. We do not have our heads full of information that we're going to pour into you, like pouring, a, pouring water from a, from a jar into a glass. Instead, we produce context in which you can learn, produce environments in which you can learn, learn things that we don't know. So by given, being given certain uh, objectives and tasks and things you have to do, you have to fulfill a brief, you have to uh, you know, execute on a design, you're going to learn the processes that get you there. And this is how also you kind of deal with the skills component in a context in which we don't necessarily want to directly transfer your skills. We're not going to hold your hand and show you which buttons in Unity to press. We're going to throw you at a problem and say, here's Unity, figure out how to make it solve that problem. Unfortunately, there are courses that think yeah. exactly like that. Yeah. I'm not gonna mention who, but I've worked for them. Yeah. But um, yeah, I, I loved the first, when I was teaching on the Game Enterprise course, I, it was amazing, it was an amazing atmosphere, because uh, something you said about there about yeah. em, uh, employing people who don't like games, yeah. I hate games. <laughs> I, 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 used to, I used to love games, I was a gamer right up until I started making them, and now I, I just don't play them. Not like, not like I used to. I don't like what AAA games has become. I don't want to run around shooting things. It's not because I don't like shooting things. I just, it doesn't interest me, you know? I'm really interested in, uh, have you played Monument Valley? Yeah, I love that game. Because it's a train game. And that's all, I've, that's the only time I've got to play games these days. I've got a wife and two kids and a, and a, and a bunch of demanding jobs. I get to play games on the train. And, and those are the sort of games I like playing. You know, something that's got a little bit of bite to it, a little bit of, keep me going. Um, my friends will play Destiny all night, you know, and Overwatch. I've, I've fiddled with it, but it's not my sort of game. But, um, so, so it's what you bring to it. But these kids, in, 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 these students in the first year of the Game Enterprise course, they were educating me. You know, I was, I was showing them things, but they were showing me games I'd never heard of, you know, different things, and it was, it was an amazing atmosphere. That's what that, I think. I think that's what F -E, uh, HE should be about. You know, it's 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 not a drill and skill. It's not someone standing at the front giving you information. It's you guys feeding information back as well. You know. All right. I think that's all we have time for today. I think we actually have less time than, than we use. Um, so thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Good job, man. Really? Uh, yeah, it's amazing. So much from places. It was amazing.